Everybody say mind games. All right, we welcome our online campus, North Campus, Manfred Campus. Today is Victory North's four-year anniversary. Started four years ago. They're celebrating four years as a church out there. If you have a Bible, go to 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. Yes. If you're taking notes, note takers are history makers. You can write in your notes. Mind games part two, dethroning insecurity. Dethroning insecurity. I used to think insecurity was a problem that only teenagers faced, because I knew I faced it when I was a teenager and all, all my friends did in middle school, high school. And then I realized insecurity is not limited to an age or demographic. Insecurity is a worldwide issue that stretches across generations for different reasons. I remember going to the nursing home a few years ago at Christmas time. Our church always visits the nursing homes every Christmas, and I was sitting with this elderly woman. The nurse told me, this woman is gonna pass in the next month. She's in her final last month of life, and she could really use some, some encouragement. So I walked into a room. I said, ma'am, can I come in? She says, yes, sir. I come in there. I said, are you doing okay? And she says, no. I thought that was a dumb question that I asked just then. And I said, um, I just want you to know God loves you. And she just put her head down. I said, and not just God, but we love you. A Victory Church. And she interrupts me. She said, no, you don't. I said, yes, we do. She says, no, nobody loves me. I said, what? She said, nobody's come to see me in years. She says, nobody loves me. I'm not a lovable person. Nobody likes me. And I remember just sitting there beside her. And I was, I was so, one, I was so convicted that insecurity stretches across generations. The, the feeling of nobody loves me. The feeling of I don't, I don't feel seen by people. I feel invisible to people. The feeling of I'm not even a lovable person. Those are all insecure feelings, by the way. Like insecurity is not just what are people thinking about me? What about the pimple on my face? I don't feel secure in myself. Insecurity is thoughts of does anybody love me? Am I a likable person? Am I okay with people? Insecurity, it affects everybody. It affects every demographic, every age, every season of life at different times. I've seen some of the wealthiest people in the world struggle with insecurity. And I used to think if you make a certain amount of money, if you drive a certain car, if you live in a certain house, eventually you overcome insecurity, but you have different types of insecurities. So there's insecurity that can hit someone who feels like they don't have enough. Then there, there's insecurity that hits someone who has so much, but they're second guessing every person around them, the motives of people. Why are, pe are people really my friends? Or are they just friends with me because of what I have? Do people really love me or do they just want something from me? The insecurity that keeps a man up at night, he can't sleep at night, the racing thoughts, overanalyzing, the woman who overanalyzes, second guesses every conversation she has with her friends, walks out of the house and thinks, I wonder what they're saying about me not that I, now that I'm not there. I wonder if they're talking about me. I wonder if they really like me. I wonder if I'm actually a likable person. I hate my personality. I wish I was different. All of these are insecure thoughts. I wish I was skinnier. I wish I was prettier. I wish I was handsomer. I wish I had what they had. I wish I was richer. I wish I was a baller, shot collar, 20 inch blade on the Impala. I wish I had what Mike had. I wish I had what you had. All of these are insecure thoughts. And I want to look in scripture because if you don't dethrone insecurity, insecurity will dethrone your purpose. If you don't dethrone insecurity, insecurity will not just dethrone your confidence. It will dethrone your ability to be who God's made you to be. Insecurity is one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now. It's not just sending people into suicidal thoughts. It's killing marriages, families. It's causing people to give up on dreams of one day getting married, having children. It's insecurity can cause you to push away the very people who love you. Insecurity can cause you to walk away from relationships that God's called you to be in because you have problems on the inside. And, it, and as a man thinketh, as a woman thinketh, so is he, so is she. So in 1 Samuel 18, this man has everything. He's the first king of Israel. His name's King Saul. You can have everything you want. You can have the most powerful position in the world and still feel insecure. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 5, whatever mission King Saul sent David on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased all the troops. Underline that if you don't mind. Why does it matter that this pleased all the troops? 
as if every decision is supposed to be approved by people. I think one of the biggest contributing factors to insecurity is the approval addiction. I need people to like what decisions I make. I need people to like what I wear. I need people to like who I'm dating. I need people to like where I'm working. I need people to like the way that I am. I need people to like my personality. I need them to like my decisions. I need them, I need them to like my posts and my stories. I need their likes. We have a generation that's obsessed with being liked. And the problem is when you're not liked, you start questioning, why am I not liked? Why does people's approval matter so much to us? And it's not just young people, it's all people. It's all people. We wrestle and we battle with, I need people to like me as a leader. I need people, and, and it's one thing to be a good person that, that you, you're aiming to try to leave your best impression with people. It's another thing to live for the addiction and the applause of man's approval. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, the fear of man is a snare. It is a trap. Trying to live to please people traps your life. It paralyzes you. So the only way out of insecurity is to stop caring so much about what people think and start focusing more on what God thinks. But here King Saul is obsessed. One of the biggest reasons he loses his kingdom is because he's obsessed with getting people's approval. So he's happy, he's like, okay, they liked, it. They liked that decision. I'm so glad they liked that decision. So then he keeps going. He keeps on promoting David. He keeps on giving David more opportunities. And one day when David was coming back with all the men after war, they were coming back into the town of Jerusalem and there was people singing and dancing and celebrating David's victory right there in front of Saul. And this is where it gets a little salty. <laughs> no pun intended, Saul. All right, let's go to verse seven. It says, as they danced and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his tens of thousands. Did anyone see the movie Toy Story, number one? I know there's like 10 Toy Stories now. But number one, it shows the contrast between a character named Woody and a character named Buzz. Woody was the, the toy that everybody looked to and they liked, and he was like the leader of the toys in this kid's room. And then all of a sudden, this kid for Christmas gets a new toy. And this new toy is flashy, he's awesome, he's excited. He's like, he's got wings, he can fly. His name is Buzz Lightyear, played by the voice of Tim Allen. Home improvement. Come on, I like that guy right there. But um, Woody gets threatened, and he's like, why is everybody looking at Buzz now? And you watch the contrast of these two toys and the jealousy and the comparison trap, and, and most of us think the movie's about toys and it's all that. The movie's really about identity. It's about identity. It's about knowing your value and your worth apart from looking to the left or to the right and comparing yourself with other people. And um, I was listening to, I was watching that movie and I was reading this scripture and I thought about my own journey of insecurity. And before I get into Saul, by the way, Saul, it, it, takes him, it takes him down. This comparison trap, this insecurity, he spends the rest of his life trying to chase what David has. As the king of Israel, he literally dethrones himself from his position as king because of his insecurity, and he gets into this chase to try to keep up with the Joneses, except for it's trying to keep up with David, trying to have what David has, trying to be better than David. He's throwing spears in his mind at David, and eventually, if you're throwing spears in your head at people, you start throwing spears on the outside. This is why God warned Cain when Cain was jealous of Abel. One of the first sins in the Bible was jealousy. And, and, and it was between two brothers. One brother had favor. One brother, everything he touched succeeded. Everything he did, it was like, this guy's amazing. And Cain was jealous. And God warned Cain, because God can see our thoughts. God said, Cain, I know what you're thinking about. Sin is crouching at the door of your thoughts. Shut the front door. I just wanted to wake you up on this cold Sunday morning. <laughs> Shut the door on the devil. The subtle art of not giving a foothold to the devil. I'm preaching out of my book, Mind Games, by the way. <laughs> it's not about just mental and emotional health. It's also about getting rid of jealousy, comparison, envy, insecurity. Because when you have envy, you have every evil work. And God warns Cain. He says, don't do what you're thinking about. Don't think about it any longer. Don't give any more thoughts to that. Saul had the opportunity to stop in his thoughts and say, hold on. It's not worth my life 
comparing myself with David? Why would I step down as king of Israel to chase after this young guy who's succeeding for our nation? A win for David was a win for Saul. Insecurity doesn't allow you to celebrate other people. Insecurity gets you focused on yourself. The first letter in insecurity is I. At the root of insecurity is a self-centered pride. I'm teaching this morning. Don't miss this. I'm telling you, God wants to speak to all of us today to deliver us from this spirit of insecurity. It's a demonic attack. I got into my own like comparison trap in 2016. I remember when my friend who I had grown up with, done music with, and we both stepped in as pastors at the same time in the city of Tulsa. I preached at his church, Greenwood, before it was tra- changed to transformation. He preached here at Victory. But in 2016, he had, pra- he had prayed, and he asked me to pray for him. He was like, Paul, we've had some hard struggles in our church. Just pray that God gives us a breakthrough. I was like, absolutely. I was like, Lord, give Mike a breakthrough. And then God gave Mike Todd a breakthrough. <laughs> the man went from like, nobody being impacted that much by what he was doing to the whole world, watching and following and celebrating and being touched by his ministry. And it was amazing, except for I was caught in a comparison trap with Mike Todd, the pastor of Transformation Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Can we just give Transformation a big hand? We love them. We love Mike. This story is like a very vulnerable story. So just trek with me for a second. I'm going to be honest, y'all. As a pastor, I wish that I was 100% always like Jesus, but I am a human in need of the mercy of God on a daily basis, just like every believer out there. And I got pulled into this comparison battle. And I remember just looking at his stuff, and it was going amazing. And they were adding four services, five services, six services, reaching people all over the world. And then we, we had kids in the same class at Victor Christian School, and he would come up to me and be like, Paul, did you see me preach at Elevation? I was like, yeah, very cool, man, very cool. <laughs> Super passive, aggressive. And uh, he was like, dude, he's like, God's using that message. It's got millions of views. It's reaching people all over the world. I was like, nice, nice, nice. And I just was like, what? And I was salty. I was salty, right? Just like King Saul. And I was allowing envy and comparison. And then the Lord began to lead me through a crucible. And we're going to look at another character in the Bible who had an opportunity to get jealous because his, his actual followers were telling him to be jealous. In John chapter 3, John the Baptist had a baptizing ministry. He was baptizing people in the Jordan River. And John's followers, his closest friends, they said, hey, John, don't you care? Everyone you minister to, everyone you discipled, everybody you poured your life into, they're leaving your church services and they're going to hear this other guy named Jesus. And John the Baptist, instead of getting jealous and salty, he says, good, he must increase, I must decrease. It is all about him. Any good thing you've seen me do was never from me. It's all for the glory of God. It's all from God and through God. John dethroned his insecurity, and we're going to talk more about that. But before we do, I just need to confront the ugliness of the comparison trap, because it is ugly, and we don't always talk about it in church. We just kind of like skim past it. We're like, don't compare yourself. The truth is, we all do this at times. Whether you compare yourself to your sister, your brother, a friend, who your dad was, and uh, who your mom was, someone else who has more than you, someone else who's skinnier than you, someone else who's getting married faster and having kids and getting the promotion you wanted and driving the car you wanted, living in the house you wanted, living the dream you were hoping to live by now. We all get into these comparison traps. And the Lord led me through this crucible of dethroning insecurity by first dethroning his selfish, vain ambition. And I didn't know it was there. I thought that all I desired was to impact people. I was like, Lord, I want to impact people. And God asked me this question one night. I was here at the church when no one was here, and I was down at the altar, and I was just praying. I was like, Lord, I just want you to touch our church and minister to our church. And God said, Paul, is this about the glory of God, or is this about the glory of Paul? Because if it's for the glory of Paul, nothing that I do in your church will ever be enough. You'll be chasing after someone else's impact. You'll be in a competition with other pastors and leaders. And I heard the Lord say, this has taken down so many pastors in the church worldwide. It was a comparison trap. If it happened to King Saul, who was anointed by God, 
Don't you think it could happen to other anointed men and women? Even David's own son, Absalom, had the same battle of jealousy and comparison. He, he tried to kill his own dad because he wanted what his dad had. He didn't know how to honor. He didn't know how to celebrate. He didn't know how to walk in contentment with his own lot in life. He needed some other man's lot. He needed to have what they had, and it took him out. And I heard the Lord say, Paul, if this is for the glory of Paul, it's gonna take you out. But if you will allow me to dethrone everything in your heart that's not of me, you'll, you'll make it. You'll make it, Paul. If you do this for the glory of God, you can make it. But you're gonna have to get rid of every spirit of envy, jealousy, comparison. If I only let you reach 10 people in your life, you're gonna, you're gonna celebrate that that's what I allowed you to do. And if God uses Mike to reach 10 million people in his life, you're gonna celebrate what God. By the way, we gotta stop elevating stages and opportunities as if that's the greatest use that God. God's using people that nobody knows about just as much as he's using people that, he, that everybody knows about. We all are valuable. No man is better than another man. No woman is better than another woman. But we oftentimes think this in our eyes. We're like, they're better than me. They're, they're greater than me. They're more valuable than me. And it drives us into insecurity. And I called my pastor, Pastor Larry Stockstill, a pastor who speaks into my life, who challenges me, speaks truth and love. And I said, Larry, I just need to repent. And um, I need to own this, that I think I've been in a comparison trap and I've had envy and I, I need to repent of it. And he said, Paul, what's, what's going on? Tell me about it. So I start describing it. He said, who's this with? I said, his name's Mike Todd, he's a pastor. He goes, oh, I love Mike Todd, he's great. He's one of the best preachers in the world today. I'm just like dagger in my heart. He's like, everybody's going to his church. I was like, I know, you know, and I'm like. <laughs> and he said, Paul, God loves both of you. God sees both of you as valuable. You both have a lane to run in. I remember watching the Olympics years ago when Michael Phelps was swimming and he was winning all these championships. And, and there was this picture on TV of Michael Phelps in one lane, and he, his head was straight forward, just focused on his lane. But the guy next to him that was a couple feet behind him, his head is literally staring at Michael Phelps. You can't win when you're always looking to the left and to the right. Insecurity gets us off of our lane and causes us to be obsessed with trying to chase another person's lane. People tried to compare me and my brother growing up. People were like, your brother's funnier than you. I was like, I know. They're like, people like your brother more than you. I'm like, okay, I, you're right. People would try to compare John with me. And I'm so thankful that we, we overcame that comparison battle because today John and I are each other's biggest fans, just loving each other, celebrating each other, just in each other's corner. That's the way it should be in the body of Christ. Sisters gotta stop comparing each other. Stop like just throwing shade on people. That's not flying, that's falling with style. You know, that's what Woody said to Buzz Lightyear, like what are you talking about? It's a toy story. And I said, Pastor Larry, I'm sorry. I said, you need to repent to God, but Paul, when you're ready, you need to go talk to Mike. You have a friendship with him. And the, and the, he said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, the thief has tried to steal your friendship with Mike. And today, you're dethroning it. He said, I, I'm really proud of you, Paul, for doing this. He said, very few people can come to the awareness in their self that this is there and then admit it. He said, now the, the final step is to go to Mike. So I did. I called Mike up. I said, can we meet at Metro Diner, this breakfast place in Tulsa? He said, yeah, what's up? I said, man, I just want to talk to you and got to share something with you. He said, okay. So I meet there. I go, Mike, you probably haven't noticed this. He's like, I've noticed it. I'm like, you don't even know what I'm about to say. He's like, I know. <laughs> I go, Mike, I just need to repent, man. He's like, I love you. He's like, you don't have to say it. I was like, no, I want to. I said, I need to repent because I've been in a comparison trap and I haven't celebrated you the way that I should. I think it's interesting that the church is really good at grieving with those who are grieving. Like, when someone goes through a painful loss, we're like, oh, I'm here for you. But when somebody does something great, we're like, quiet, crickets. When somebody gets a promotion, when somebody does something that, like, fulfilling their dreams, we're like, cool. 
We're really good at being there for people who are down. But what if we could celebrate with people who are up? What if we were secure enough in ourselves that we knew who we are in Christ, that we could come alongside Buzz Lightyear, we could come alongside those around us who are losing weight, who are doing incredible, whose kids just like became an honor student. They're starting on the basketball team. Like they're married, they're they're celebrating their their first child. They they just bought a house. What if we could come alongside them and say, man, I'm so happy for you and genuinely mean it. Not like, I'm so happy for you. Oh my gosh, if you just knew what she was. (laughs) And, and, And that happens when we dethrone insecurity. I gave Mike a hug that day. Metro Diner, the employees were watching it. Some of them went to victory and some of them went to transformation. There were people in the, in the restaurant. Someone paid for our meal. They literally came over to our table and they said, I don't know what's going on, but I've watched both of you cry today and I'm crying too. Because <laughs> I was crying, Mike was crying, and then other people started crying. They, it was like they were all part of our conversation. I was like, y'all been listening to this the whole time? And we took a big picture with everyone in the, in the restaurant. <laughs> From that day on in 2018, I was able to truly love my brother and celebrate him. And we both have different voices. I'm called to preach something different than him. I'm called to be someone different. I'm not called to try to keep up with him. And our church has a calling on it that's different than their church. We celebrate them. We love them. We're different. We can celebrate Life Church and Battle Creek and Rama and Transformation, all the churches in town. God wants every church to do great. God wants every person in the kingdom to do great, to obey his calling on their life. But we can't get to a place of healing until we dethrone insecurity. And so I want to give you real quickly four ways to dethrone insecurity before insecurity dethrones you from your purpose. Number one, renew your mind to God's word. If I'm thinking all about what you think about me, which by the way, people don't think about us as much as we think they think about us. Just turn to the person next to you and say, they're not thinking about you. (laughs) Truth is, they aren't. So we gotta stop thinking so much about what people are thinking about us because that drives us into insecurity. That drives us into the approval addiction. That drives us into always obsessed with their opinions. And we gotta start thinking about what does God say about me? What does God's word say? Romans 12 verse two says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Numbers 13, 33, there's this report where the Israelites come back from looking at the promised land and they tell Moses, we can't take the promised land. They're bigger than us. They're stronger than us. We look like grasshoppers in our own sights. If I think defeated, I live defeated. If I think small, I live small. If I think I'm unworthy, I live unworthy. If I think I'm unlovable, I always have a hand out when people try to show me love. I'm like, I don't trust your motives. I don't trust you. I've been hurt too many times. I'm not lovable. If I think that way, I live that way. Thoughts drive behavior. Every day. You're going to change your life in 2024. You got to change your thoughts. This is why I wrote the book Mind Games. Because I want people to win. I want people to have victory. It starts with renewing our mind. Renewing our mind to what? Renewing our mind to God's word. Joshua and Caleb had a different report to Moses. They said, yes, we might be smaller, but we are well able to take this promised land. We are anointed and appointed to take the promises of God. They knew who they were in Christ. Ephesians 2 says we are God's masterpiece, his handiwork. God created us in Christ Jesus to do great things. Before we were ever born, God had a plan on our lives. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We are the children of God. We have been paid by the highest price. The blood of Jesus has forgiven us of our sins. We are the redeemed of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Our value does not come from what job we have, what salary we have, what body type we have, what age we are, who we're connected to, how many followers we have on Instagram or TikTok or how many people like us out there. Our value doesn't come from what man looks at. Our value comes from what God says about us in his word. We are made in the image of God. 
There was a man in Judges chapter six named Gideon who saw himself as weak, unworthy, the youngest, the least likely to be used by God. And God shows up to Gideon and says, hey, you mighty warrior, you're a mighty man of God. The Lord is with you. Take courage, Gideon. God's hand is on your life. You're anointed and appointed for such a time as this. Gideon keeps on driving back into this insecurity. He's like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. But God keeps renewing his mind until finally Gideon gets it. I want the band to come out. Number two, trust completely in God's love and validation for you. Gideon had to learn to trust that God's validation was greater than man's validation. People might walk away from you. People might belittle you. People might say, you're not good enough. You're not worthy enough. You're not as smart as your sister. You're not as skinny as her. You're not as strong as him. You don't have what he has. You're not as good of a communicator as him. Let people say what they want to say. Trust in the validation of God. Stop trying to chase the applause of people. You want man's applause? Join the circus. But if you want God's approval, you've already got it. You're a child of God. He's called you. He's anointed you. He loves you so much. David believed this in the Bible. David wrestled with insecurity, but he would remind himself in Psalm 139, the thoughts that God has for me are good. He says, Lord, your thoughts for me outnumber the sand on the seashore, and every single thought is a thought of love. He says, you love me, Lord. You love me, Lord. David just believed in the love of God. I was sitting with our youngest. We have five kids, if I haven't told you. And I was sitting with our, our youngest. She's two and a half. And as I was holding her, getting ready for bed the other night, she said, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And it just melted my heart. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And as I was listening to her sing that, I thought, we learn these songs as kids, but the older we get, we have a harder time really trusting and believing that that's enough for us. So instead, we're singing, do people like me? Do people like me? Do people love me? The Bible doesn't tell me so. It's true. The Bible doesn't tell you that people are going to like you. Because that promise is a shallow promise. People liking you will never be enough. The Bible does promise God loves you. And perfect love only comes from above. And it casts out all fear, all insecurity, all anxiety. If God loves me, I'm going to make it. If God loves me, I'm going to get through whatever I'm going through. If God loves me, I can make it through my hardest night. When everybody walks out, God stays with me. Jesus stays with me. He stays with you through every painful trial you go through. It's enough, my friends. His love is enough if you let it be enough. It doesn't mean we don't need people's love and their help, but we gotta stop needing so much of their approval. Number three, see yourself the way God sees you. God doesn't see you as some weakling, some little worm barely making it through life. God sees you as a champion. God sees you as more than a conqueror. God sees you as his own child, and he loves you. When God looks at you, he doesn't look at someone who's full of dirtiness and ugly sin and someone who's unworthy of being loved. God looks at you, and he sees what his son did for you on the cross. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. And he says, my, my friend, you are forgiven of every thought, every deed you've done, no matter how bad it's been. God looks at you and says, you are redeemed. You are loved. You are valuable. You are reconciled with the Lord himself. Number four, here's my final point. Don't just see it. Speak over yourself what God says about you. Don't just see yourself the way God sees you. Speak over yourself what God says about you. When you know who you are in Christ and you believe it and you say it, you can celebrate others. You can walk into rooms with confidence and not be wondering, am I liked here? Where do I stand with people? Drawing thought bubbles over their heads like, I know they don't like me. I know they didn't mean that. I know they're not really for me. Stop. Stop talking yourself into insecurity. Start talking yourself into victory. Start talking yourself into Godfidence. I said Godfidence. It's not confidence in ourselves. It's confidence in God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he who lives in me than he that's in the world. Would you stand to your feet all over this place? 
We're going to end today by speaking some confessions of victory over your heart and your mind. This is really from chapter six in the book. And I pray if you haven't gotten the book, you get it because I truly believe this message is important. If you can't afford to get it, let us know. We'll try to figure out a way to have someone sponsor the book for you. We'll get it for you. But I I want you to get this in your mind. Just say this with me. I am a child of God. I am forgiven because of what Jesus has done. I am redeemed from every curse, from every sin. Jesus has redeemed me. I am a masterpiece because God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make accidents. God made me and he made me great for his purpose, for his glory. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed to be a blessing. God's going to use me to bless other people. God's blessing is on my life. I am a candidate for the favor of God. His mercies are new this morning for my life. I have not been given a spirit of fear, a spirit of insecurity, but power, love, and a sound mind. I have the mind of Christ. I have a sound mind. I have peace that passes all understanding. I have joy, and the devil can't take it away. I am not defeated. I am more than a conqueror. Greater is he who lives in me than he that is in this world. I will fulfill every purpose that God has on my life. I have the victory. I'm going to walk in victory because Jesus lives inside me. Come on, give him praise this morning. You believe it, church. You could, you listen, you got it. You got it. You got it. You're great. You're amazing. Turn to the person next to say, you're great. You're a child of God. You're amazing. All right, listen, before we leave today, I want to pray. You didn't come to church in the freezing cold just to leave without an altar call. We're we're that church that still does altar calls. We believe that God has something powerful at the end of every service to do in someone's life. So if it's just for one person, that's okay. But I want us to bow our heads, close our eyes. If you're here today and you just sense the Holy Spirit is leading you to surrender. Maybe you can relate with me. Maybe you've had your own comparison traps with people. Maybe you've battled some insecurity even in the last year, the last month. Maybe your mind has been in a place where the enemy has been whispering lies to you about your future, about your past, keeping you in shame, keeping you in a place of not truly believing in the words of God over your life. And you just need to renew your mind today. You just need to surrender those lies of the enemy, those thoughts from the enemy to the Lord today. All over this room and those watching online, if that's you, if you need to surrender, just raise your hand. Raise your hand all over this room, yeah. You're saved, but you need to surrender some things to the Lord today. Hands going up from the front to the back. You need your mind renewed. Maybe you've had anxiety on your mind, fear on your mind, worry, stress, hopelessness, discouragement. Maybe you've had thoughts of apathy, just giving up, just settling for life and not believing for more, not believing for greater, not believing that God has greater things in front of you. If that's you, just lift your hand today. If you're here and you just need prayer, you just need healing, you need God's mercy. Maybe you're not right with the Lord. Maybe you've not given your heart to Jesus. Today's your day for salvation, to repent of your sins, to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. If that's you, lift your hand today. Don't leave this room without getting saved. We're not promised tomorrow. We never know when it's our time to go. We gotta get right, right with God, right with other people. If you raised your hand or wanted to raise your hand, would you leave your seat? Come and join me at this altar. Just step out of your chair. Don't don't think about what anyone else cares or says. Listen, this is a great day to dethrone insecurity. We're celebrating mighty men, courageous women, brave girls, brave men, brave dads and grandparents and brave moms and grandmothers, brave college students and young professionals.
professionals and leaders to just say, Lord, renew my mind. Renew my mind. Lord, dethrone every insecure thought, every feeling. Lord, work in me. God created me a clean heart. Do a Genesis work in me at the start of this year. Do something new and fresh. Let there be light in the dark places in my mind. Let there be hope. Let there be life. Let's just worship God all over this place. If you want to come down to the altar, just come and find a place. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You're a child of God. I'm no longer No more fear. A slave no more fear. fear. No more insecurity. fearfully made. You are a mighty warrior. You are a mighty woman of God. He celebrates you when others, when others don't. He stands with you when others don't. He walks with you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He says, you have a sound mind. Lord, I just pray for someone who hasn't been able to sleep at night, that tonight, God, they're going to get good rest. They're going to know who they are in Christ. Lord, I thank you. Insomnia has to go. Insecurity has to go. Fear has to go. Anxiety, racing thoughts have to stop in Jesus' name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. There is peace within your presence. Ask me, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. He crosses.
the Sea of Galilee just to heal one man's mind. He'll cross whatever sea he has to to heal your mind and heart. Because I know there is peace within your place. I speak to Just say this with me. Jesus, I surrender. I surrender my mind, my heart to you. Thank you, Jesus, for renewing my mind, renewing my heart, removing every lie of the devil out of my mind, out of my heart. Dethrone the insecurity. Dethrone the lies of the devil. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins. I repent. I receive your forgiveness. You are my Lord, my Savior, and I am all yours, and I have the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, 